Hi, this is Paul. And for a number of you, the guy I'm with today is no stranger. Uh, Damian Walter has a science fiction channel, and we're going to find out quite a bit more about him. And I'm going to want to talk about metamodernity and science fiction and storytelling and sense making and all of those good things today. So, Damian, thanks for agreeing to talk to me. Thank you for inviting me on, Paul. I've been a long time time watcher of your channel. You're my guide into the uh, this corner of the internet. Well, I, I think I, the first video I saw of yours was one you did talking about Jordan Peterson and you were just walking through this landscape. <laughs> and I really, I really loved that video. And my wife actually wants me to do some videos kind of like that. Um, but I, I, I haven't yet, but I probably will. So I might take that from you, but let's, sure, let's, man. let's begin with the beginning. Um, okay. You, where you're living now, did you grow up there? No. Uh, I'm uh, uh, at this point, I'm a 10 year digital nomad, which wow. is the term, which is almost unheard of when I started doing it. Uh, and I left the UK actually to write an article for The Guardian about uh, digital nomads. And whilst I was doing that, I decided there wasn't a particularly good reason for me to head straight back to the UK because I could move all of my work online. Uh, 10 years later, uh, which has been extended by like four years of COVID madness. Yeah. Uh, I'm in Bali uh, at the moment. I was here during all of the lockdowns and so on. But I'm thinking maybe of relocating back to Europe um, kind of spring next year so I can do more interviews, actually, because uh, the time zone difference is a bit of a killer here. Yeah, yeah. Well, where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in the UK, um, but I'm half... Uh, half British, half French. So one really? half of my family is is French, uh, but I only built up a strong relationship with them later on in life. So I'm not a good French speaker. But they're they're really lovely. They're a huge French Catholic family. Okay. Uh, so that's one side, and I have a family in the UK uh, as well. But I grew up in the UK near London. Everywhere in okay. the UK is near London, basically. Yeah. All roads lead to London. Yeah. Did you did you grow up in a religious household? Well, that's an interesting question. So I grew up with my mother uh, and actually we lived in, if I say housing estate for, for Americans and Canadians, I think that's going to give you the idea that I grew up on like a large baronial mansion somewhere. Uh, but actually it was like uh, uh, state housing, council okay. housing. And we lived in a, a little apartment, but my mom was massively into books, which I was really lucky about. Uh, so she had on like a special shelf in the middle of the living room, uh, a Bible, which I have to say we didn't look at very much. And at the other end of that shelf were all the works of Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis. So I would say Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were something like my religion okay. uh, growing up. And then also writers like Arthur C. Clarke. And I'm a third generation science fiction and my grandfather was really into uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. And my mom still had some of his books. And then my mom was into Tolkien and, and Lewis and many other writers as well. And then I've made my life around that kind of uh, that, that modern mythos of sci-fi and fantasy writing. So did you were you one of these one of these kids in school that just read, read, read? Did you stay away from the television and? Uh, no, I watched a lot of television as well. In, okay. in some ways, I regret the amount of time I lost on television and video games. I was quite a video game addict in my teens okay. and early 20s as well. So the whole of what we call nerd nerd culture now has been super important to me. Okay. Okay. And what was school like for you? Did you enjoy school? Uh, I found school difficult as I progressed through it. Uh, I was a good student. Um, it was always very easy for me to learn. Uh, I kind of think that I have a journalistic way of thinking. It's very easy for me to pick up the the big picture of what's going on in an area of knowledge or conversations that people have. But if you really prod me, I might I might not know as many details as I sometimes sound like I do, because um, I, I try to cross a lot of fields in what I'm I'm doing. But I'm always happy to admit that. I hope when I don't 
really know all the details. Uh, but school was, uh, as I got further into it, I I started to find it a little bit oppressive. Hmm. I think I'm very much an uh, an outside the system person, as you can probably guess from me being here in in Bali. I like to interact with systems as long as I don't have to be be in them. And of course, school didn't give me a lot of option about yeah. that. Yeah. I saw a little Jordan Peterson clip recently and he was saying or it might have been one of his recent interviews uh he was saying when he had clients who were creatives and if they couldn't do creative work they'd go crazy and i'm very much like that i i have to feel that i'm doing something creative and and constructive uh and i've tended to to move through through jobs that were creative for a while and then I'd move on to the next thing. So I've had lots of different work experiences, but school often didn't let me do that, especially the end of school, comprehensive school being kind of driven around classes all the time. I was, I was never a particularly big fan of, and now I'm the kind of person that if you let me near your young people, I'll say, don't go to college, <laughs> uh, run off, run off and do something creative instead. So did you go right to university after, um, I know the British system's a little different, or was that, well, everything you say was also true of university for you? No, not so much. I did go to, did go to university. Uh, it was kind of a struggle for me to get there. Mm. Um, uh, lots towards the end of my teens and early twenties, there was lots of difficult personal stuff, but I did manage to get myself to university. I studied media, which turned out to be a course in uh, uh socialism light oh. uh, i studied all of the postmodern philosophers uh whilst i was there and i was also very engaged with radical politics and so on as well uh so i got to university but i didn't do particularly brilliantly okay there. uh in a way i wish i'd i'd waited and done it at a a later time in life or just been a bit braver and run off into the world like i would tell myself to to do now i think so, so what happened getting out of university? Did you, did you drop out? Did you find something that was more interesting? Did you graduate and then do something? Well, when I was at university, one of the really good things is I had 24 hour a day internet access uh, <laughs> uh, at the library, fortunately. So it forced me to use it in at least semi-constructive ways instead of just playing Counter-Strike, uh, which I would end up doing for a little period later on. Um, but on the internet, I was playing this online computer strategy game. This story is going to go somewhere, I promise. Paul. Uh, it was called Stellar Crisis. It still exists as a game. It has a little core of players. And it was a web browser strategy game uh, around kind of 99, 98, 99. But I actually started blogging about it. Uh, and all of the players at the time, and there were many thousands of players worldwide were reading my blog. So I had my first experience of online writing fame. Uh, and it was a little buzz and it lasted like a few months until people moved on to the next thing. And I had my first experience of losing my, my online writing fame. <laughs> uh, so, but so what was of... that like? Uh, well, it gave me a good understanding of what I would have to call online toxic masculine communities because mm. we were incredibly uh all of the worst cliches of stuff that would uh appear in like uh 4chan or or 8chan later on i had to be say i was kind of guiltily involved with but i learned a lot about the dynamics of those uh communities why people engage with them um uh, what the kind of of kind of little factions that grow up even within uh, small communities. So that kind of form of online communication has then threaded through my career since. Um, I kind of worked on the edges of, of tech and advertising and PR and their kind of intersection, uh, managing things like online marketing for a little while when I left university. Um, but I had been living in uh, Leicester as a student, and I was uh, running workshops there because uh, I, I wanted to write and I was always drawn towards teaching as well. So I just started running writing workshops, volunteer in, in libraries. 
Uh, and that actually turned into a job. The local council really liked me and they wanted to keep me around. So they turned me into a basically a community worker in in Leicester. And I was working with arts and writing and storytelling. And I did that for uh, five years in one role and then another three years. And I learned a huge amount about um, people and stories. I guess my work for your audience, they, they would probably understand it through something like Jordan Peterson's self-authoring program. I was helping lots of excluded people um, uh, understand themselves through uh, the nature of their story. And I really got to a kind of insight that, to simplify it, that people who had a sense that their story was happening in some way tended to be quite happy as people, even if they had very adverse circumstances. And people could be really wealthy and comfortable, but if they didn't think their story was happening, they would be quite unhappy. So I started to think a lot about being story-driven creatures. Human beings are, are the story that we're telling in some way. Uh, and that that ultimately led me kind of back to academia. I was doing some creative writing teaching uh, at Leicester University for adult learners. And that led me into researching story, which is a lot of what I've done whilst I've left the UK as well. So talk to me a little bit more about I think, you know, I think I have an intuitive sense, but I'd love you to flesh it out. Their story was happening or their story wasn't happening. Um, flesh that out a little bit more. So one group of people that uh, I worked with were, because I had natural empathy with them, were a lot of young men like myself, but who were much more excluded, who'd been unluckier than I was. Uh, and they were often very fixated in the way that I was as well on science fiction and maybe had the ambition of being a science fiction writer. A goal they'd set themselves was to be William Gibson or, or Philip K. Dick and to create something like that. And if in a project we could um, let people express that to some extent, publish a little anthology of science fiction stories, then that person's story had had started to come together. Now, what I started to discover from that was that then there were all kinds of issues that arose from there because all of a sudden, quite naturally, everybody's ego kicks in. You've taken one step on your story and now you want to continue that. And that leads into uh, lots of lots of dynamics that perhaps those people weren't familiar with you've moved them one step on their story and that's going to be really complex to continue so I started to realize that I didn't have enough understanding of what I was doing to really help people really and you realize that I had built quite a big community around that and then there are people it's quite small the number of people you can really help you can really offer emotional support to and then there are people on the edges of that who feel like they're falling off uh and all of that started because i was still in my early 20s at the time it really overwhelmed me the situation i was in really uh so i had a kind of elements of burnout uh which manifested as just feeling really sick of what i was doing uh and that ultimately left, kind of pushed me towards leaving leaving that work, which was catalyzed by some kind of economic changes where the funding for that kind of work became much more difficult to, to locate as well. Uh, and th that was kind of uh, a crisis point for me, really, because I was so invested in this sense that I was helping people through this work and it was all ending around me. And I was also overwhelmed by by doing it as well so i had to step away from the the whole thing in my in my late 20s and then try and understand what i'd been doing because like my conscious understanding of story wasn't there at the time this is something i can narrate later on uh so i really i kind of uh stepped into teaching in a university setting for a while which was substantially easier to do and then had all of these thoughts developing about stories uh, and how they drive us uh, psychologically. So I began researching all of the, the storytellers I could find. And also at the time I was meditating 
I had begun a meditation practice and kind of story and meditation began kind of orbiting around each other um, as different sides of the same, the same thing, I guess you might say. Talk about that. That's very interesting. It's mm. very interesting how your you had these, it, it sounds to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you had these moments of your story happening. You know, when you mm-hmm. had the blog, suddenly your yeah. story was happening, and then you have a sense that it's not happening. And then you get into this work and you're you're helping people have an epiphany, a discovery, sort of their first step into into this other realm in a sense. Mm. And, you know, it, it doesn't surprise me that when you were teaching in university, because then of course you had an institution around you. And I don't just mean, um, you know, what we might think of an institution, but these implicit institutions too, because when I listen mm. to your um, your story, I'm thinking about people who start, um, let's say, let's say they become a Christian and they start reaching out to others individually and they sort of develop a ministry, but then they very quickly bump into the fact, just like you described that I've got a very limited number of slots in my life where I can mm-hmm. actually pay close attention to these people and offer them the kind of, uh, the kind of fellowship, the kind of it really fellowship is the right word to yeah. to have both your story and their story continue especially if they are from a community that was just sort of full of dead ends mm. so i can i could very much you know given yeah. my background and my father's ministry and and my life in the church i can very quickly see what you describe happening Mm. Um, that's, that's super interesting. And, and, you know, I've gotten senses of this listening to you, your videos. Um, but the, when you talk about, you know, their story was happening, you know, it, it's almost another realm, you know, maybe Tolkien mm. would call it fairy. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of the conversation around, the death of Christianity today at the hands of modernity might call it enchantment. Um, mm. Is what it, it's so interesting how we have this implicit sense of it, but it's it's not at all an easy thing to sort of articulate and and set in front of you. I think especially in this in this modernist era when we're so fixated on objects. When that's mm-hmm. much more of a narrative. Mm. So, so you saw this, and, and it sounds like you had a sense of this in yourself. Did well, let me ask you this. Um, did you always have a sense that your story would happen? Or were there crises around anxiety about that? Uh both. Both. Because I think the more strongly you have an idea that your story is gonna happen uh the 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 larger the anxiety that it it also won't uh so i had uh uh there's a writer called mary reno and she was another favorite writer for my mother and she wrote a brilliant novel about the young prince theseus she wrote a whole arc of novels about uh classical greece uh and the bull from the sea uh, no, that's the second one. The King Must Die is the first novel. Uh, and he's very young and he goes on his heroic journey. Theseus is kind of one of the the early archetypes of the, the hero's journey. And I'd read this very young and I've always remembered this story very intensely. And I think that that archetype is kind of caught up in my psyche as it is, especially for many young men. I think yeah. that is one of our heroic archetypes. And we want to go and find a way to fulfill that in the world. And for me, one way that that happened, because I'd had a lot of disruptions around my late teens and early 20s, as I say. And then by being able to help people, I found that I was also fulfilling my story. That became an early way of, of doing that for me. Uh, and then when that that started to um, become too too overwhelming, uh, or I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it, that's like a first 
first crisis point. What's my story going to be now instead? Uh, and I guess I've moved through a number of things. I don't think I've answered that that question particularly at the moment i still definitely spend a lot of time thinking about how i'm going to make my story happen in the world in mm. in general terms um but i guess i've been able to go through stages of hopefully more self-reflection and uh awareness uh about that so so talk to me about the relationship between meditation and story because mm. i think in some ways you know i see at least some forms of meditation tend to be non-narrative mm -hmm. and intentionally, yeah. let's say, resistant to narrative mm. and then story of, you know, narrative itself, let's say. Yeah. Um. So whilst I was thinking about story, I had been teaching, teaching at like a big group of adult learners uh, who are really great to work with, lots of retired people in the group. Uh, and I was also invited to work on the uh, the national creative writing curriculum, which was awful. So I previously <laughs> taught creative writing. I say there's massive problems with the subject. But as I was trying to think about that, so it, it began as kind of an attempt to improve how I might teach that. And I saw there was this confusion between writing, which is a great medium, and I've spent a lot of my life trying to get better as a writer and stories and stories happen in all kinds of mediums and they have a very particular effect we feel immersed into a story so i began thinking about why we feel that sense of immersion uh and i read as much as i could and i i was trying to pull together uh different knowledge from different areas of storytelling so on one hand you have uh, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and the kind of the philosophical tradition of uh, critiquing uh, stories in culture. Plato's cave, of course, is kind of about storytelling. Uh, and then you can go all the way in the other direction. You have Stephen King on writing or popular handbooks about uh, writing. And then you have the, the uh, narratologists. So that's the kind of academic study of how story and society interact uh so you had like todorov in that area and a whole bunch of others although that's uh, the narratologist won't thank me for saying it but it feels like a kind of dead academic discipline at the moment uh and then there's also the areas like psychology so jung and freud and lots of other areas uh they start looking at fairy tale and myth and when I started pulling these all together, I, I started to see a repeating pattern in the story. And, and examining that pattern became my first course, which is the rhetoric of story. Uh, and it's about the seven foundations of story. So uh, stories are focused on change. At the center of that change is a, a self, like a hero or a protagonist. Um, then we have our relationships to others. Uh, there we have levels of conflict. Uh, we have the events that the story is made of, the structure of the story. And this is all pinned together with the seventh, which is emotions, the way that that whole structure triggers emotional systems in us. Uh, so that, that course has been very successful and continues to be. It's um, I think we've passed 60,000 students online, people who've watched the course on the different learning platforms that it's on. And uh, I do various kind of online seminars with them. But at the same time I was putting that all together, I had I had started a meditation practice initially through Buddhism, which was my um my answer to being in a very secular culture. So there's probably a whole conversation about why people growing up in secular Western cultures uh, particularly gravitate towards Buddhism. I mean, it's probably the easiest answer for us, but in the the kind of 15 years of that practice, it started with Buddhism. I spent some time in India. Uh, I became more and more interested in Hinduism. Uh, and finally, in the probably in the last two years, I've been thinking much more about Christianity, my homegrown mythos that I really didn't understand at all because uh, I'd only had a very bad introduction to it, I think. Uh, in all of those traditions, I tend to be attracted to uh, the mystical 
traditions rather than the uh, the more external teachings of them, although it's all interesting. Uh, and but especially through the the Buddhist meditation practice, which I did go very deeply into, I realized that uh, in this in the storytelling, I'm constructing the same thing that I'm taking apart in the meditation practice. Uh, so the the line that I um, simplify this into, is that story is the operating system of of consciousness? That the the reason we're we're here and and self perceptual is uh, because we are a kind of self narrating story. Uh, in the psychological tradition, making that story stronger is an answer. You give people ego strength so that they can deal with the world better. Uh, but then I guess in the meditative and spiritual traditions, we're thinking about that, taking that apart to, to because all of our suffering is, is related to that story, that character that we're playing out in the world as well. So that's how I related the two. And that's probably where I am in my, my thinking about them at the moment that, we have this story construct and we build it through stories and we have a, a chance to at least examine it through through meditation. I can't say I've succeeded in stopping my ego uh, particularly strongly, but I, I hope you don't stop it. Your, your ego provides uh, me and I think many more than um me a lot of a lot of good stuff so uh i hope you thank I you hope it, i hope it keeps churning out mm -hmm. now um it, it's interesting then that you become a digital nomad or a wanderer of sorts how did how did that happen uh so it was to the end of my kind of community work career and i'd also been um uh through doing that i I'd, I'd become quite well known i was also doing journalism at the same time uh so i was kind of writing book reviews and columns uh, so i i kind of gained some some level of profile again my story was was happening um but i was very uncomfortable hmm. with with where i was and particularly interactions with like more and more i guess like structures of power mm -hmm. in in the uk that's a, a bit over dramatic and uh, at one point, I was approached by, I got invited to a meeting by some people who I knew, I won't go into too many details, and I was invited to run to, to be an MP, a member of parliament, and I probably wouldn't have won, but that's what you do. You, you get invited to lose once for political reasons, and then you'll be given a, a shot. Um, and my I felt, well, now my story's really happening. I've been you know, invited through a doorway and I don't know, maybe this is too personal, but no, I went home and I vomited. I felt nauseous basically. And I, I sat and I tried to think about this and I was like, I don't want to do that at all. There isn't a, well, my ego is drawn to it, but I'd already had the experience of being sucked into things I didn't want to do because of my ego really. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do that. And I, I realized that I was more on the path out of these structures. I couldn't bring myself to go and play that game, I guess. So the answer instead was I wanted to, to take a much more creative path. So being outside the UK economically, it's quite useful. It reduces my, my costs of living. It puts me into much more creative places. So I went to Thailand initially, uh, really went very deep into meditation practice through the Theravadan tradition, then India, um, Tibetan dream meditation, which is is really cool, but I don't know how much of it I made up in my head at the time. That's a whole other uh, thing. Uh, so I guess I wanted to be outside the, the traditional structures of things. So I've taken my teaching, I've made that an online business now. I've been a little distracted the last year by trying to be a YouTuber, uh, I think, which isn't really my core mission, but to build something independent, you're always experimenting with yeah. different different things that you might do. Yeah. Uh, so YouTube is like a little part of what I'm doing. But it it was that 
that desire to be outside these systems but now there's a part of me that is drawn to to rejoining that in some some form i have no idea what what that means yet i just have a feel a little draw to it at the moment that's i think that's that's really that's I, that makes total sense to me it makes total sense to me um because i mean i Sacramento, California might not sound like far away, but in the system of the Christian Reformed Church, it's it's really the fringe. And um <laughs> I for at least in in terms of that, that the the real career of mine, the one that I've derived um my vocation and income for most of my life, um, I've I've often preferred um the edge. And for many of the reasons that you've stated, it you know, I talk about Grand Rapids, Michigan as a, you know, place that is so self-centered that not even gravity can escape or not even light can escape because <laughs> once you're in the middle, once you're in the middle of power, all you know is the center and the, your ideas of what's out there are tend to be so just so, such crap mm. that, um, no, I, I get that. I get that. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, you've been you've been working. On, well, let's talk about science fiction first. Um, I, I yes. you know one of one of your videos that I caught about you know whether or not Star Wars is science fiction, <laughs> which I which I really enjoyed. Yeah. Um, and I I really want to spend. There's a lot of videos out there that I want to spend more time with. And your conversation with Jonathan Peugeot and David Fuller on Rebel Wisdom. Mm. about science fiction and sense making and it's even heightened by your description of these young men who feel themselves stuck being drawn to you know aspiring to become science fiction writers many of mm. the you know i grew up you know my father worked in african american communities i worked in african american communities worked in the dominican republic in the dominican republic they all aspired to be professional baseball players in the african american communities they all aspired to be nba players or rappers um these young men aspire to write science fiction well that's really interesting and mm. i'm sure now you've had a chance to think about it tell me more about that desire and why that and and what does that tell us about the role that science fiction is playing in our collective sense making and collective mm. story making mm. uh i i think one of the the unpleasant things that our culture does is kind of uh give us a degraded self image in a way and two of the images that the the marketing industry pushes very strongly are the the jock and the nerd. Uh, and I think it's very healthy that nerd culture has reclaimed that that title for itself. Because really it is the the young intellectual. And if if we have maybe like kind of two masculine paths, you have the athlete, that's the healthy version of the jock, uh, and and the intellectual who might be the priest at sometimes or the scientist or the artist. Uh, and science fiction writer is like an expression of that because science fiction is is kind of a rogue field. It attracts mm. these kind of prophetic figures like Philip K. Dick, and uh, it is it has a kind of rock star cool in a way. The the science fiction writer for the people who see it that way. Really, because so I, I would I would yeah. think, I mean. Actually, you stand a better chance of getting in the NFL or the NBA than to be a science fiction writer who is actually <laughs> famous. There are more yeah, famous yeah. athletes than yeah. science fiction writers. That's a pretty small list. But the famous ones have this very odd cultural position. So like Neil Stevenson or William yeah. Gibson or, yeah. uh, you know, the handful of them that are out there, they're incredibly admired across the tech industry. They're yeah. they're they're kind of politically influential increasingly so i would see it as an almost a, a kind of emergent religious field i would call them prophetic figures for our culture in because this is what we're doing with with science fiction in in my rough picture of it uh we're 
we're taking this new world that we're in of uh, science and technology and we've let go in the Nietzschean sense, God is dead. We, we've let go of all of the old Christian myths for most people. So as I said in that, that interview with Jonathan Pajot, at the time when I saw The Matrix, uh, I, I think I was living in peak atheist secular society, 2000, basically pre-internet. Uh, and if you're in the UK, there, there are churches all across the UK, but they're kind of tourist attractions. And there are congregations as well, but most people have no interaction with any kind of mythic tradition at all. So unsurprisingly, when you really think about it, we've just reinvented the mythic tradition through science fiction. Uh, so you can see in science fiction emergent religious structures from the mythos. So I tend to believe that that's the order that this happens in. We have uh, um, uh, this kind of hotbed of storytelling. So I think you can see that in like the early Christian tradition. In fact, Viveki actually has described it as fan fiction, like Gnostic fan fiction, and all of these different texts being written about the around the monasteries of the Middle East and so on. And then these kind of become various different religious structures over time. And I think we've done something at much higher speed through the 20th century. You have this uh, pulp science fiction uh, writing scene, and you have these figures emerge from it, like uh, H.G. Wells earlier on, or then Robert Heinlein, Jules Verne, Ursula Le Guin, you know, lots of these figures. And they're each creating different versions of this new technological mythos. What does it mean to be a, what is a human now? So we've gone from thinking of ourselves as some kind of creation of some kind of consciousness to seeing ourselves as machines. I think that's the dominant belief in the world now, the, the unconscious belief. You're a machine. Uh, Mary Shelley explores this in Frankenstein. Well, if we're machines, then you could take a bunch of our spare parts and put them together as a new human. Um, what would that mean? And part of what we encounter through that is the bleakness of this, this modern model. It's very difficult to... Um, internalize the idea of being a machine of being in a completely deterministic clockwork universe that that not just doesn't care about you it's not even doesn't even have animosity towards you it's unconscious of your existence uh and i think this this causes very great problems for people so what we do is we've constructed new answers to this through storytelling so if you look at something like uh what's jokingly called in science fiction the rapture of the nerds uh the idea of a singularity a technological singularity where we uh we will upload our consciousness into servers somewhere some computer substrate and we'll live on forever so we've reconstructed heaven there uh we do similar things with transhumanism so if we're only machines we'll just improve our machineness uh, and make ourselves immortal and never have to grow sick and die and i call these structures the neo-religions of science fiction so you have scientology which is a very obvious one that's l ron hubbard literally a science fiction writer making himself a a guru. I have Scientologist friends, so I don't want to. What what I like to say is that I'm um, an equal opportunities non-believer. Uh, whatever your mythos is, I don't believe it. I'm very interested in it. I want to try and understand it. Um, so when I was able to talk with Jonathan, it was interesting because I think he's very skeptical about science fiction and mm -hmm. any modern mythic narrative. And I can overlap with him because um, I try to look at all these things skeptically, but at the same time, science fiction is also my home uh, tribe, uh, I guess. Uh, so I'm very attached to it uh, as well. And I'd love to have another conversation with Jonathan at some point because we have enormous overlap whilst also yeah. being at opposite ends yeah. of yeah. Uh, spectrum. I think. And that's, yeah. that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the 
I read Frank Herbert when I was in when I was in high school. Um, and I, you know, grabbed that book and, you know, Herbert, you know, Dune, I read, you know, four or five of those books. Of course, I read Tolkien, all, all of this stuff. There is this, and, and, you know, really comes through in Dune, this interesting relationship, obviously, between fantasy and mm -hmm. science fiction. And if you look at the, the major fandoms that have sort of possessed uh the west over the last few decades i mean even harry potter is so you know so magic you know magic mm -hmm. it's i mean these things sort of go you know flip one way or the other and you know as a protestant as i'm watching this this turning of many to let's say orthodoxy you know jonathan peugeot the ortho bros and the author bros. <laughs> this, so that's what they're called. They're uh, they're uh, Martin Shaw has joined. <laughs> that's right. Well. They're yeah. a very intense tribe. Um, okay. Yeah. But it's you know, and to me that that doesn't seem like like you said it's it's opposite, but it's they're like opposites. Mm -hmm. There, it, it would seem to me because the um, the hard return to the past mm. is. And, and there's been a long history. I mean, if you, I've been thinking lately about the various revival movements that have swept through Christianity really since the 15th century, and they're they're almost all reenchantment movements. Mm -hmm. uh, Pentecostalism is is one of the strongest ones. Pentecostalism is is basically a complete denial of the the disenchanted universe. Um, they're, they're just, you know, they just basically give, they give modernity the finger and say, no, nope, I don't buy any of it. Um, angels, demons, this present darkness, uh, work by Frank Peretti. So, mm -hmm. so sketch out for me some of your thoughts about the relationship between, you know, fantasy and science fiction. Of course, Lewis, you know, sort of dabbles in both. And, yeah. you know, I've yeah. been reading the, the, the Ransom Chronicles and, you know, it's very clear that Lewis is, is working stuff out um, through both. Yeah. So science fiction is a form of fantasy. Uh, it's it's a fantasy for uh, a specific audience because we all want to to have uh, maintain some kind of belief in our fantasy, especially as it gradiates into a spiritual or or religious system in some sense for us. Um, so, like I was saying, with the neo-religions of science fiction, these are all uh, essentially fantasy structures. But I don't mean fantasy in terms of containing elves and dragons, although there are often analogs. Uh, so Dune is is literally a medieval fantasy set in space, and then it becomes more interesting things than that as well. Um, but really, in the the psychological sense of fantasy, that we we start your you're a little kid looking out of your classroom window and fantasizing that you're flying through the clouds instead of in this dull classroom and then we have a whole progression of of fantasy structures that we we move through and as we age in life are um what we the need that we need fulfilled through story becomes more metaphysical what's going to happen after i die what is the meaning of of all of this um so science fiction is is a way of symbolically framing a set of fantasies that answer eternal questions for us like um what is out there what is the space beyond my perception well now we literally call it space and we populate it with with planets and black holes and starships traveling among them and some amount of that is scientific fact but the idea we're moving interstellar travel, that's very much a fantastical construct that we can play out exactly the same kinds of stories we were telling in more mythic settings um, before. But this, uh, you know, I don't have an answer to this, to this conflict. The reason I haven't finished my second major course in science fiction, writing the 21st century myth, there are two final lectures to add to it and the first one is the cost of fantasy hmm. so 
I can, I have all the parts for this lecture. I just haven't given it yet. And that's moving through all of the stories we tell and showing how all of these are fantasies on some level. So we can take everything from Santa Claus to our big religious constructs and say, that is from one way of looking a fantasy. It's fulfilling a, a personal need for us. Um, but I can't live with that answer uh, on its own. So this, the final lecture is the truth of myth. And I'm trying to pull together how we can find truth in our, our mythic stories. And that's the deconstruction is, is easy to do. The reconstruction is the hard question. And I think that's where we, uh, our conversations have been moving into this meta-modern label because it starts to, to focus us on the reconstruction of our, our fantasy stories and myths. So these are all in some way equivalent different parts of the same things and i think there's a general awakening that that long deconstructed process that we've been through isn't an answer in itself uh, and now we have many movements who are about the reconstruction or the re-adoption so i guess that the um sorry what was the term for the bros the ortho bros the ortho bros yeah i guess the ortho bros are an answer to that. I guess a powerful answer because something in orthodoxy engages a particular kind of uh, space in our psyche today in a similar way that Buddhism does for like the Sam Harris's yeah. of the world. Yeah. Sam's well, ability it, to, to reject prayer and then go and sit and meditate for for hours is is interesting. Um, but I guess we're all doing that on some yeah. some level, yeah. Well, I was, we just did an event in Southern California and one of our, one of the sidelines was visiting in a significant Orthodox church. And I just found it amazing that, you know, I, I try and hear many people's stories, finding guys who six, seven years ago were big Sam Harris fans and they're lining up to kiss a, to kiss a box full of bones of saints. And I'm just sitting here thinking, wow, this is this is really interesting. <laughs> hmm. Part of part of what's this this might not surprise you because I I you I probably have a sense of at least some of the emails you get from people. Um, I get I get a decent amount of correspondence from people who are really earnest about me making more videos about. Um, let's say Navy fighter footage of Tic Tacs and okay. um, uh, um, alien. Uh, and, and I've always, you know, I've, been, I've always been interested in this and I do in fact want to want to make some videos about this. Um, I've been um, uh, what, what's, what's your take on, mm -hmm. on the extraterrestrial conversation with respect to this question of story and mythos i mean mm. any any thoughts on that i'll leave it really open well we have different um emergent alliances across the tribes of our culture and ufos are a really interesting meeting point because on the one hand if you look at a lot of the ufologists the people who have dozens of books published on the subject many of them are catholic or in similar areas of of belief uh oh. and the ufo is uh for me at any rate i, I don't want to disrespect people's belief in them uh so i uh, but i'll be really frank these are unexplained radar signals okay so i'll just put that there but we can project onto things of this kind so on one hand you have this kind of it's a way of thinking about angelic entities visiting the earth uh, but in alien form and on the other hand they're they're allying with uh the the technological tribe who've had a very strong dream and their dream peaked with the space race and we actually went to the moon and we built the rockets and uh, the spacesuits that had been fictional in 2001 were now real. Um, 
and it seemed like we were going to space and particularly for that i guess it's the the generation in the 50s 60s and 70s now which is quite a large proportion of my listenership on the the podcast um it was going to be real and then it didn't happen hmm. and all of our emergent knowledge is um that we're not we're not going to the stars and nothing is coming from the stars to see us and what what something like the climate change narrative for instance focuses people on is the necessity of living together on this on this planet without an escape from it but that's that's very unacceptable to people so the emergence of ufo's is also a way of reinforcing that story so the technological story and the religious story meet together in one place and that's very potent for a lot of people uh and of course it also ties into our government is keeping something from us and if you can find one thing that's being kept from us then everything else is being kept from us as well so it's like john john is the person who introduced me to the scientific definition of bullshit so I think UFOs are first class bullshit, basically, like lots of people have a reason to push that story forward. The media, there's there's in mainstream media organizations, there's always a fringe of things that the journalists know are bullshit, but it's acceptable bullshit to talk about. And UFOs are in that area. Your editor won't fire you for writing a, a clickbait piece on on ufos they'll probably be happy about it anyway <laughs> so UFO oh people, the comments email. are going to be fun <laughs> <laughs> well you did ask i did ask and i i i'm very i uh, know i i'm oh this is going to be fun this is going to be fun um uh, metamodernity Mm -hmm. That seems to be, at least for me, and and you've been very much helping me, sort of, because we've all, we've had a sense that modernity or post-modernity is spent. And I think in looking at um, a lot of the talk, po post-modernity didn't offer us what we want from narrative, mm -hmm. from story. And so now, what describe, can you give a little thumbnail definition of meta modernity is that a term that mm -hmm. you've sort of you've sort of settled on and are comfortable with or where's that at for you yeah i'm i'm because of my discomfort with being in structures i like things in the process of becoming defined so as soon as meta modernity becomes a rigidly defined thing i will disclaim it and and stop talking about it but <laughs> whilst it's a gray area gooey thing i'm quite enjoying it um, and there's there's an aesthetic idea. So if postmodernity is like uh, uh, balloon dogs blown up to the size of a house or something like that, a, a sense of fun absurdity. Meta modernity is sincere irony as a, as an aesthetic. But I'm more interested in it as part of uh, a thread of discussion around uh, what's roughly called developmental theory uh so jordan talks about this through figures like piaget uh, but he doesn't tend to continue it on into discussions of adult development uh so and there's there's a whole range of theories about this that i'm still learning about so you go all the way back to hegel in uh so it's like 200 years ago now basically uh and his ideas of a, a kind of a development of human consciousness over time uh, there's ideas of this kind from eastern philosophy as well so you have figures like sri aurobindo uh, who's also come up in some of the uh viveki and um greg Henriquez discussions i think uh and then it kind of catalyzes in uh really i have to say over in new age for around ken wilbur who I would roughly call uh, a Zen Buddhist philosopher of a kind, although he crosses into lots of disciplines. Uh, and the idea that there is some kind of progress of uh, the adult human psyche through stages of development. And these also express um, on a civilizational scale. 
Uh, and this gives us some kind of guide to the development of civilization. And the simplest way that we talk about this is with the idea of modernity, which is in the phase of development that we're in. There was a pre-modern, which is roughly the, the age of the great religions. Uh, before that, you can also kind of identify a tribal and a heroic stage. So the heroic society is something like ancient Greece or Rome. The tribal is, is much earlier than that, much smaller human communities. Uh, but now we have some kind of emergent post-modernity, which you would say is this emergent phase into Western culture from the 1960s onwards. There's lots of seeds of it before that, but things like the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, these are all aspects of this postmodern era that's emerging because it's very concerned with its driving force is social justice as a cause, basically. Uh, and of course, in more recent discussion, uh, the label that's given to that by many of its opponents is, is woke, wokeness. That's roughly what's being pointed at. Um, and of course, this is a great conflict. So our culture wars today are very loosely the, the religious structures, which still have a lot of strength in the world, the modernist world of technology and global capitalism, and this kind of emergent postmodernism, which is still taking shape, but is increasingly powerful in the world. And they're all fighting each other. And uh, so for, for Ken Wilber, uh, his integral theory is about stepping beyond those conflicts and finding ways to integrate all of those into one. And metamodernism is a similar discussion. Mm -hmm. The meta is to, to try and stand outside the pre-modern, the modern, and the post-modern uh, and find integrations uh, between them, which is very difficult because okay. I'm, I'm really rooted as a, 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 a modernist person uh, with a lot of postmodern education. Uh, so particularly in my previous kind of incarnations, you know, I was, you can go and find some of my old columns for the Guardian or the Independent. Uh, and you would say that's, he's woke. He's absolutely woke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it would have been very easy for me to, to carry on down that, that path in a way, but I'm really glad I didn't because it's opened up much more interesting discussions to try and be able to talk much more widely across the culture but i'm i'm saying this because i'm still going to continue to fail at it no doubt so you know i just want to i'm not trying to put myself up in some kind of meta modern perch and say i can i can solve all these problems but i see lots of people stepping up mm. to that position metaphorically uh, now, like yourself in, in all of your discussions as well, you seem to be doing very similar things. You, you said, you said something about, um, religions and, uh, uh, this isn't the word you used, but their potency. Now it's interesting mm. to me, you know, I, I went to Europe for the first time last summer, um, spent a amount of time talking to a lot of different people, some of them Anglican clergy and, very interesting dynamic. I mean, with respect to religion, the dynamics in the UK and the dynamics in the United States seem very, very different. This, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. in, in, for many Americans, um, Europe and, you know, for, let's say, American Christians, Europe is quite, or especially the UK is very mythic. I mean, many of our, many of the commentaries on my shelves are written by English scholars of course, mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis is, uh, it's it's difficult to describe how, you know, the impact that C.S. Lewis has had on Christianity over the last, you know, 50 years. Um, mm -hmm. And and you're living in a place in the world now. I know, um, you know, I, I know people who have moved to Bali. Bali is kind of a place where uh, you know, Americans, maybe maybe they ran a successful yoga studio in Sacramento, and in <laughs> fact, I could name names. And then it, it was so funny. One day, my my um, 
someone someone tells me that they um oh someone so and so so and so said your name because you had a conversation with David Fuller and I thought wow there's you know interesting things but you're I mean you're very much living in a different place in the world mm -hmm. so how do you see as John Verbeke calls the legacy religions and their vitality in this space of ongoing mythic development yeah so in bali there are two religious trends and one is various forms of new age belief um yoga being the the strongest one but then there's the traditional hindu religion of the people of bali as well right. which is still really strongly practiced so it's a living breathing mythos hmm. here it's integrated into people's lives although now of course everyone has a smartphone so that's gonna have some impact on that and you see absolutely that that is much better for most people uh to have that structure in place it maintains uh, families, community cohesion, going through the lockdowns is very difficult for everybody in Bali, but they still have strong family structures, strong community structures, which are very related to these religious structures. Uh, and as someone who is a very independent, outside the structures person, it's actually much nicer for me to be in a place that has strong hmm. structures that I can contribute to and be in, involved with. So if I was to think about what a healthy future human community would look like, it would have all of these layers that we're able to, to operate in. And one of the, the biggest problems in our modern world is the way that the modern urban world has undermined the, the more communal rural world. And of course you see that in the political conflicts playing out around us. Um, because we we did something uh, very important with those religious structures. So I listened to Tom Holland talk about pederasty in the Roman Empire. Uh, and you, you hear the description of that. So let's just take it as, as given uh, that this is just standard for powerful men and the the divide the gender divide is really between do you have power or do you not have power and everyone who has power just eats everybody who doesn't have power and that's that's the roman world that's a heroic society because it's just pure ego unfettered ego basically and my understanding or developing understanding of christianity as a structure is that this is the story that beats the roman empire it, it tames the ego over time. It puts it into a structure. And I think it's it's a problem for the people now. And I definitely went through this phase, my Richard Dawkins reading phase of just hating religion and saying religion caused all the wars in the world. And actually it, it's 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 nonsense, really. What religion did was massively upgrade civilization, to use that metaphor. Um, from the stages that had come before uh, and the the problem from a, from that developmental model that we were talking about is instead of continuing to build on that the modern era had to push had to destroy religion had to take it away from people so that I guess that reaches its peak in communism and the Soviet system where religion is is outlawed you may have no belief other than the the big brother uh who's watching over you and uh, so what we're turning back to for religion now is some uh is the observation of the, the emergent ego again in the world which it's very it's very healthy it it drives our business world which provides all of this material uh improvement that we've had in the world but then at some point it becomes malfunctional and toxic as well. So what lots of people are doing is turning back to the religious structure that previously answered this question, which I think we need to do to an extent. But I'm over in the camp of people who are saying we can't just return to the Christian story. Uh, there's too much change and dynamic flux in the world for 
for it to effectively cope with, but it needs a place and it needs to be honored and respected in our society. And it's probably going to resemble whatever story emerges next, because you, you tend to see uh, in this developmental way of thinking a kind of alternation between ideas. So, uh, you know, we often look at that, that kind of postmodern emergent phase, uh, and it's much more about the collective which is very uncomfortable for our very individualistic society. But it also shares that with the religious structures that came before. Uh, they were much more communal structures. And so is whatever is this thing that is emerging over here uh, as well. So I think we're at this point of finding some new articulation uh, because clearly the way this has happened through the, the 20th century was was not healthy or working. So I would say that all of the the political problems, so you have so it stop me if this is getting too no uh, no no keep abstract going abstract here, Paul. You have you basically have fascism and communism emerge around the same time. They're both utopian visions of the future. They're both about collectivism in different ways. Um so they, I don't think it's unfair, although many people are going to be angry with me for this. I don't think it's unfair to call them postmodern. They're, they're mm. a kind of very early, broken, postmodern manifestation mm. into the, the world. Uh, because the people who are organizing these as well, it's all about narrative and storytelling. Yeah. Uh, the Nazis are imposing a new myth on the German people which many of the German people want to buy into as well but it's completely manufactured they've just taken a Hindu swastika and a bunch of occult jargon and rammed it all together and turned it into the the Third Reich basically uh, but that's a very postmodern characteristic is the invention of narratives that are very appealing to people uh, so you know even in saying that I see how how deep the the problem is that we're we're facing we have all of these conflicting um cultural structures that are all very narrative driven have different attitudes towards story and narrative and now we're looking for something and i label this now metamodernism that can somehow integrate all of these into a healthier coexistence with each other does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Well, there's no, I, I, I very much like, like how you did that. And it, it is interesting that, you know, both, both Nazism and communism fail. I mean, they, mm. neither of them finally, and, and well, Nazism is, is obviously defeated communism sort of collapses under its own weight and you know to the degree that it's held in places like cuba or china it's mostly abandoned and mm -hmm. you know much older much older forms have sort of you know invaded it from below and you know the, the facade is still there but other other things are are governing and well it's it's very powerful in western nations yes at the moment amongst probably the under 40s generation because socialism really emerges because of the failings of capitalism right uh the ways that people are left behind by it and i think that the last period of capitalism has left an entire generation behind and that what they're looking at is some new narrative that answers that for them and the obvious one unfortunately is a socialist communist narrative that's the one that's on the table yeah. uh, so i think unless it's replaced for people they will gravitate back to it yeah i am i am skeptical of the um i am skeptical of the activists because just about mm. everybody i know under 30 who is complaining about capitalism they themselves wish to get rich. And I am old enough to remember my parents' generation who um, 
would deny themselves material prosperity and affluence for the sake of other dominant beliefs, such as their yeah. Christian faith. And so um, even though I think it's it's really it's really chic to to complain about capitalism, I find that on the lips of all sorts of people who are, you know, trying to get the biggest and the best house and chasing <laughs> the American dream. And it's like, oh, so you don't like capitalism, but you really love money. Uh, tell me more about that. <laughs> it's well, like, I think I, they're just saying they don't they don't like not not winning in capitalism. Right. To the level at which they want to. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they complain about they complain about the lottery because they haven't won, but it doesn't mean yeah. they stop playing. Um oh. Well, I have I have pestered you. Um, I don't know if there's anything you would like to ask or anything, you know, anything you would like to turn this conversation in any direction. Yeah. What do you think is because um, I was following the the spiritual home conversation uh, in in the little corner of the Internet? What's. I don't want to just say like the future of the little corner, but what's emergent? from this conversation that you're overseeing at the moment? I, I think what's clear is that there is a hunger for exploration beyond the silos that have contained a lot of the conversations until now. Mm -hmm. And those silos have been understandably tribal. I mean, you have to, you need a container to have any kind of identity. But the um, in in some strange way, it's it's been a it's been a space where people can come into it with their agenda, but it's in some ways sort of a new idea marketplace. A new people are gonna not gonna like what I'm about to say. Um, it, it's in some ways a secularism 2.0 hmm. because. And I think that has real connections to at least what I'm seeing in this emergent meta modernity, because it's not that, you know, we have ortho bros, we have people who had abandoned their Catholic faith, but are now, you know, not very happy with the Pope. Uh, we have all manners of Protestants who are exploring all sorts of things. And we have people mm -hmm. who you know, feel very comfortable with, with John Verveke and um, would probably love to live in Bali with the other New Agers. So it's a really <laughs> eclectic bunch who are of, of mostly fairly highly open people who are finding conversations with people outside their tribe fruitful. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, it's it has a relationship to secularism because there is a there is an implicit procedural manner by which we explore. And I think it, I think it comes about because even though many people are sort of returning or even sort of doubling down on legacy religions, these legacy religions for them are re-enchanted. Um, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Richard Rowland, Jonathan Peugeot does his universal history with him and, and Richard Rowland, you're going to have to go back and look at exactly how he phrased it, because he basically said something to the effect that, you know, if your religion isn't more fun than television, why bother? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think a number of people have, you know, looked at the fandoms of Star Wars and Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and said, why not, you know, why not kiss <laughs> a box full of saints bones, you know, why not go on a pilgrimage if, you know, the meaning crisis, you get to a certain point and as long as you don't sort of slide off into nihilism, why not fully inhabit something that I, I need not justify it because the nihilism that is um, prevalent in the culture is justification enough. And so there's a, a sort of fideism that develops in there. And I think for a lot of people, the corner is a place where they can 
sort of safely have a community in which to explore, sometimes to, you know, set up a booth and promote their own newest answers. But because for many of the people, their answers are so new and their their costumes are so um, newly sewn together, there's also a sense of new things are emerging and the variety of answers are pretty broad, even mm -hmm. if I stay right in this one place. And that's that's sort of when I watch people and what they're doing, um, I, I see that. And so for for Christians like myself, it's it's an it's an opportunity to have conversations with people that I never would get a chance to before, and for me to continue to learn and grow and potentially even incorporate things that I would never have discovered within my own, let's say, my own little Dutch Calvinist tribe. So that it's in, in many ways, it's a learning community and it's a it's a community that gives some shelter for also for people who they're comfortable with not having their minds made up quite yet. Mm. And they're a little allergic to silos. Yeah. I don't I, know if that I, helps. No, it does. I've for a while, I've been calling the culture war, the culture chaos. Hmm. Cause we just, we took all of the cultures and just threw them into a big digital online dish and mix them all up. So you can go on YouTube and learn about postmodernism and then the the ancient desert fathers of, of Christianity within the same 10 minute gap. And you hear all of the deep secrets of the universe, uh, all of these philosophies over time that have been uh, bred. And I've, I've only located two communities that aren't completely deranged by this at the moment. Uh, and one is the little corner and the other is the meta modern community. And I have no doubt there are some others out there but i'm interested by their overlap because the meta modern community is very new age it mm. is kind of new age going over to atheist and then the little corner is maybe new age going over to some kind of fundamentalist beliefs on the other end yeah. uh, but it, it, it does seem to be about this is openness but also a sense of humor about the way we do so some of the integral theory people are very serious about it and difficult yeah. to talk to, but it's the people who, who see the, uh, the kind of absurdity of where we all are and can laugh about it a bit, who are more open, more open to the discussion. So that's what I valued in, in mm. uh, the little corner, I think. Mm. And thank you for, for, for breeding that. Cause I think your commentaries upon it are a major shaping shaping force of the community actually well thank you i i think for a lot of people we see plenty of fighting on youtube and mm. at a certain point it's like you know it's really more fun to talk than to fight it yeah. really is and and it would i would much rather make friends than lengthen my list of enemies and so and 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 if you know, and I think in some ways that is part of what I am trying to bring to the corner mm -hmm. because, you know, sometimes there's, there are plenty of things that people want to engage me with and, you know, arm wrestle over things and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll play a little bit with them. We just have a new pipe, puppy in the house. And so we're, you know, it's, it's fun to wrestle with the puppy and, and do some of that. But um, in the end, what I want out of my relationship with, with the dog is is not um you know is not a fight what i want is what i want is a real relationship where both of us brings our bring our strengths to the relationship and both of us profit from the the interaction so and i've always wanted that and and the irony is that i had difficulty finding that from the platform of just my local church or even my denomination and you know jordan peterson sort of broke something open 
and I could sort of walk through in a little space and a bunch of us could find each other and say, you know, wouldn't it be really cool to just have a conversation and learn from each other? And um, even though we've got these differences. So it's been, and for me, it's been some of the most satisfying things that I've I've done in my, mm. you know, in my life. So um, I'm deeply grateful for all of the other people that make it happen because it really is just all of the other people that make it happen. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you're very much, you're very much part of that. I, I watch your stuff very regularly and I always walk away from your, um, your videos with a lot of, um, with a lot of real fruitful new ideas for some reason though, when I said so I've, I've, I really haven't gotten you in sync. And so in terms of when I have your ideas, I'm in the space where I can make a video because often the, the selection <laughs> of topics is nearly that haphazard. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for, uh, for mentions on the podcast. I, I always notice an influx of people coming to the, the videos in the channel when that uh, happens. Well, you're, you're, you're doing, I think such a, I, I think your basic thesis is right about the sense making and the way science fiction fits into it. I had never really thought mm -hmm. about it. And I still started watching some of your videos and I thought, you know, he's he's really right about this. And um and and I, I just don't count myself uh literate enough in this area. And the irony is that now that I'm sort of doing this, I have less and less time to read than I had before. So um but yep. I, and that's why I, I really appreciate you bringing um, everything that you have to the space. And I, and also I noticed that, you know, probably after we do this video, other people are going to reach out to you. So uh, the, the part of the car, my part of the corner for me is to try to continue to bring in some new voices and give some people some visibility. So. But do you think you will uh, give us more of your direct thoughts at some point? Well, I think my direct thoughts are really quite plain in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a CS Lewis mere Christian. Um, they're really very simple. I mean, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I mean, I can go down the apostles creed and you know, there I am. Mm. And so in that sense, I'm, I'm really rather, unoriginal and but i i am very interested in people and in what they think mm. and i'm also very interested in you know their you know their capacity to their capacity to i think you i think you said it so well you know they're they're i i want their stories to happen and and i know mm. that most of their stories won't happen necessarily in ways that you know if i had aspirations for them i would but i mean part of my calvinism is a very big sense of god's sovereignty and mm. um a very healthy sense of my own smallness so i the bible is the most produced book in in all of human history the apostles creed is about the simplest articulation of the christian faith um, if someone wants to ask me what the Christian faith looks like, I'll just point the Apostles' Creed and say, there it is. Now, I also know that it's a rather amazing thing that this creed has held a community together through history because, you know, I think if we could sit down and have a conversation with the Apostle Paul, he would probably seem very strange indeed, even if you're a New Testament scholar. And Augustine... Mm -hmm. Augustine approached the faith in a very different way than contemporary Augustinians imagine he would. I mean, culture is just so much that way. But the idea that something like the Apostles' Creed could be a string that all of these different generations across an enormous diversity, even horizontally, of cultures in the world that they can point to that. And that is, I mean, the Apostles' Creed is a highly compressed story. 
it's mm. you know it just down there into just very very few little statements and yeah, yeah people are going to have all kinds of ideas about all kinds of things around it but it works and and it works for me um so i mean i think a lot of a lot of people are waiting for me to unveil a program and yeah and <laughs> my program is surprisingly similar to Jonathan's Peugeot's program which is go to church and get yourself mm. into a christian community now a lot of some people hearing that would say well do you mean a christian reformed church and i think uh, well sure i'd love it but for the vast majority of people that's not going to work for them but the one of the things that you learn as a pastor is that even though I have this from come from this confessional church tradition, especially with the internet now. If you ask people what they believe, you're gonna you're gonna hear an amazing diversity of things. Yet when you look at how they live, there's incredible similarities that are impinged upon mm -hmm. them from economics, from cult, you know, from all sorts of things. So you know, whatever way in which I believe God is working through history, um, you know, and, and I, I see Lewis getting this right so often. I mean, God is both more demanding than we think responsible and more forgiving than we think responsible. <laughs> I mean, he, he has to be that way. So I, to me, I, I don't know that beyond telling people to go to church, I don't know that I'm offering more of a program than what I actually am demonstrating what I do. And hopefully mm. what I do is a witness to my master, who is Jesus Christ. So it's, I mean, it's that simple for me. So That's the hardest thing, I think, really, beyond all the other discussions about uh religious engagement for for people today is we're very of course super individualistic and driven to to chart our own course in life i did um do, were you on clubhouse when it was popular no no there was there was a really interesting clubhouse room between um atheists and muslims oh. uh, and there are about 50 people in this audio chat room uh, and they were having this fearsome argument. And I went around and started looking at the the profiles of the, the different people in the room. And everyone in there was had at least a, a higher education, BA, MA, doctors in there. Uh, half of them are atheist, white Western, basically. Half of them Islam, largely from Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and I realized watching them argue, they're exactly the same people just from different different parts of the world. And ironically, because the atheists were arguing about the universe being completely de deterministic and having no free will, uh, and the, the Muslim guys were, were saying, but Allah determines everything for us and we have to surrender to him. And none of them had surrendered to anybody at all. They were a complete, completely egotistical, strong-willed uh, guys, really. And it's the... I think it's the idea of any kind of, especially for me wanting to be outside all systems, mm -hmm. any kind of surrender to these groups yeah. that is actually the the challenge beyond believing in any of the mythic stories around it. Yeah. I, I think part of the reason of the, the popularity, at least in this one little strange place we're inhabiting of orthodoxy is the desire to surrender because orthodoxy can have a very very much protestants not so much protestants are cats all over the place but you know orthodoxy can can really get like this and i don't know i, I think some people will find a tremendous amount of relief in that because mm. you there are just fewer things you have to decide for yourself and in this world of of ever-increasing choice um a lot of people are just 
exhausted by the menu. And so to have, here's your program. Mm -hmm. Thank God. Um, others, um, yeah, they still, they still have appetite for discovery and, um, and yeah, Protestantism itself is all over the map. So, mm. but, but I think, that. but, but I do think, you know, at the, at the heart of the faith is, you know, Islam, you know, is submission, but, but I think Christianity finally is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of mm. these is love. And um, it's, I think the the challenge is, I mean, I can't take credit for so much of what I've been given. I had, you know, really competent, loving, deeply Christian, wonderful parents mm. who you know, raised me in a little Christian community at the fringe of everything. And I was able to um, both enjoy the openness of not living in an oppressive subculture, and yet the rootedness of living from a subculture that at least knew something of itself. And mm. when I, you know, talk to people who are struggling with because they've been nomads for so long they're they, they'd really love to find a home um i recognize that so much of what is easy for me is i i can't take any credit for mm -hmm. and so um you know of course the gospel of matthew come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and i will give you rest um take my yoke upon you know take my yoke upon you and learn for me um for i am gentle and so for me that's what i see in the christian faith and you know hopefully to the degree that i not only have a place in this little corner but pastor a tiny little church community that's hopefully what i can you know facilitate for people hmm. well thank you for this discussion paul thank you for inviting me on but I just want to say for people who are listening that it was me who called the UFOs bullshit, uh, not Paul, uh, and introduced Hegelian socialism to the conversation as well. So on both those threads, you can uh, address all of that to, to Damian Walter. Uh, <laughs> I'm not I'm not concerned. I'm not concerned. Um, but no, thank you. And I really um, appreciate you saying yes to this. And I, again, I, I really love what you're doing and I, I really hope that more people will listen to your stuff because I think you're making a, a really important contribution. You know, there are, there, there are times when I'll listen to the critical drinker and um, it's just a little too easy sometimes to nurture those resentments. And, uh, and I, when I listen to you, I hear a much wiser learned patient voice that can say yes there's the woke but you know there's these other points that they're making that are good points you really should think about them the woke are people too well you know i'm uh yeah from the ego level i really want my youtube channel to to blow up and be getting a, a million views per per video but i i also know that i'm not quite doing what what is going to uh lead to that um but you know, for the critical drinker, I am trying to steal a little bit of his audience yeah. away because I know I know what all of those feelings are that lead into I think the conversation about the woke actually in in literal terms is I really think it's a class conversation. It's because yeah. the people who get to go and work in Hollywood are the upper class who've been to the good colleges and most people aren't going to get that shot. Uh and resentments exist for a reason, but we have to try and uh, make something better, better yeah, than, yeah. than yeah. that. It's they, if you live off resentments, I mean, bitterness is, is not, bitterness is not what you want to become. It's, it's just not, it's just mm -hmm. not good. Well, thank you, Damien. This is, this has been truly a pleasure and I hope we can talk again. 
Uh, maybe I'll talk to Peugeot and maybe the three of us could have a conversation. I'd love to, I'd love, love to. to listen to you talk, you two talk some more. Okay. All right. Cool. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day.